So thank you very much, all our speakers, for the, the insights that you have shared um, from, from your own perspectives. And I think now we, we will go to the audience and take questions, if that's OK. Um, uh, Bill had a comment on, um, Bill, would you like to, to, to ask it yourself or would you rather? I'll go for it. Um, if there's a shortage of- Hi there. Oh, hello. Hi there. Yeah, oh, I found the button. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. I'm a bit, a bit slow on this side of things. Yeah, yeah my, my question, I mean, it's, it's a standard one. If, if there's a shortage of work, a shortage of opportunities for younger people to get out and do some jobs and get some experience, how then can they get something to put onto their initial profile and their CV as, as their starting point? Because it, it does mean that some people will have the opportunity to build a profile. They're the fortunate ones. And everybody else are perhaps slightly lower down the levels that don't get a job, don't get the opportunity, are automatically left behind because they can't meet that, uh, that fourth sector, that, that criteria, uh, the experience so how do we get around that mm -hmm. i think maya was that in response to bill's question that you've mentioned the kickstart pro program in the uk um yeah yeah do you want to say say a few words about it yeah so i think that's absolutely right um so it's just a massive problem especially in this crisis because um like I'm seeing Lynn in the chat as well saying something similar, but um, the fact that the crisis, this crisis has hit a certain sectors in particular, like retail, hospitality, leisure, arts, um, because of the lockdown measures, these are the kind of opportunities that young people take on early on after they finish their education. And when those sectors are largely down and probably will be down for quite a while, um, even if there's a vaccine, even if we're lucky and we get a vaccine in December, these sectors are not going to be back uh, for a long time. And so when people start out in those sectors, obviously, then if they can't, then what do they do? And what we've seen is just like they they are just unemployed. So looking at the unemployment figures, it's just people aren't falling out of work so much as people just aren't going into work. So the inflows into employment are completely through the floor. So the Kickstart program, yes, that's one thing that gives you six months of, um, of a temporary training or employment contract. So that's a good start. And if you don't get that, then it's just looking at different sectors, but the evidence so far says that's not really happening. There's not a reallocation of workers into different sectors. And then I guess you're left with um, what Shelley said about having someone take a chance at you. And it's just, it's just a shame that it should build that our entire kind of young people and the young population uh, have to rely on someone taking charge on them. But it's, other, other than that, it just has to be government intervention, government investment in jobs. Okay, uh, thanks. I, thanks very much for that. Yeah, so I, I'd like to build on what Maya was saying and linking back to some of the things that I was saying. So on the one hand, we can see this dramatic increase um, as Lynn has said, of that age group from the hospitality sector. And yet I know from my work in health and care that there are many vacancies that can't be filled. And that's because nobody wants to do those jobs, people say, in inverted commas. Nobody wants to do those jobs. We'd much rather work in hospitality, it's fun, it's with people of our own age. Why would we want to do one of those jobs? Well, as someone who at the beginning of my career had to do those jobs also thinking, oh, who wants to do this? I actually found it very rewarding. And there are many people that I talk to today in senior positions in health and social care who started off in their career um, with a temporary job. And while they were there, they were sponsored. Many of these organizations sponsor people who've started work to and come from the kind of backgrounds like I came from myself where I couldn't really afford to go to university but I scraped my way into it 
by having all of those jobs. But they are then sponsored and given training and then go on to professional training. And that still exists it, within health and care and in the ambulance service. There are still cadet programs. And I, I think that schools don't really know about these. They've been trying to get people to learn about them. I've um, spearheaded some of those things. But I think there's a lot of work still to be done. And I don't think the government helps. Um, it doesn't give a positive message about some of these schemes. And so some of the things where I've gone into schools and stuff talking about these uh, careers for people, they don't think of it as a career. They think of it as an unpleasant job, but actually it can be very rewarding. And that's where that intergenerational work can also happen. So there is more work being done at the moment. And if we think about all of these people who are um, people from theatres and ICU, and they're being moved into increasing uh, COVID wards, they're actually needing people to backfill their jobs. So people who do jobs as registered support workers. Um, so if the professional nurses are going in to do that, and even the registered support workers are more experienced, they're going to backfill the nurses. There is a need for, for somebody to come in and start learning that work. And so they're putting in training programs at the moment. But I, I don't know how many people in the audience would be aware that these things exist. And I think we need to make these kind of roles more desirable a feeling of pride in making a contribution to society. We all stood out there clapping our hands for the NHS and the carers, but do we really understand what some of those jobs are? And there can be a very rewarding career. Can I just add further to both of those um, contributions? Because I think there's some important issues here around um, recognising particular job roles and in our alliances report that we wrote um, about youth employment we were kind of flagging that there are these whole suite of careers that exactly as Shelley says are less attractive but they're just not being also young people are just not aware of them but I think there's another issue which is that these starter jobs just aren't there and also issues currently particularly around the, the pandemic response is that any work is better than no work and therefore low paid work is better than, you know, having a job is better than, than that. And so I would just like to push back. And I think we have wonderful care opportunities, but we would need to be rewarding people. And we as psychologists yes. need to be talking about decent work. So I'm gonna put into the chat, yeah. um, um, Rose, you're on mute. We had to say it in a meeting. Okay, we said, I'm having a I'm having a, a day where my internet's slipping in and out, so it it on mute. Well, and so I've just put into the chat our living wage. Um, so the reason that living wages matters, particularly for young people, is that if you have a wage level that allows you a to be remunerated at an adequate level for you to live, but b allows you to do that based on your core shifts. It means that you will have spaces and places that allow you to enhance your capability rather than having jobs that undermine you and exhaust you and mean that you can't move on to that next level that you've dreamed about and it derails your job, your um, future careers. So I think there are some important things about having um, decent work that is fairly and adequately remunerated. I think the pandemic has really shown important issues around how we pay, what matters to society, and the fact that many health and social care jobs are Cinderella jobs that why would you do them as a young person? Because you can't even put food on the table for your family through doing that work. Sorry, Ben. Wonderful. Yes. Um, and thank you for sharing that um, that report as well, Rose. And just if I may add, I think in terms of maybe making these opportunities wherever they might be more visible, there's a recent CIPD initiative towards mentoring. I think it's called, I took a note, Steps Ahead, um, where, they, where they aim to get young people matched up with uh, people who work in different industries. So that might be, if, if we could talk about anything positive in, in these COVID times, that might be one of the positives, perhaps. Um, I'm, I'm aware of time, so I would like to move on. Um, Lynn, would you like to come in and um, talk about your, your question? 
because I know you're doing a PhD relevant to this subject as well. Uh, or I'll read it. Um, one of the telling statistics, Lynn says, one of the telling statistics from COVID was a dramatic increase of 19 to 24 year olds moving to universal credit because of the decline in the hospitality sector. So whilst work is good for all the reasons provided, the goal perhaps should be sustainable employment. Um, and that perhaps links to the living wages agenda as well, doesn't it, Rose? Um, so Lynn says, my PhD is currently exploring government employability support programs. These statistics suggest to me a whole generation coming through that are in precarious employment. Um, I see lots of nods. I <laughs> um, Oh, sorry. Sorry. Am I miss? Am I missing anything here? Does Sumin want to ask a question? Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, good to see. Everyone, am I on mute? You know, because I'm having one of those days too. So, it's fine. It's fine. Um, but I should move my screen. But uh, I, I just want to say thanks for all the comments, and I'm just so glad I was able to to call in to listen to this. And I, I just have to say that every time I I hear you guys talk, I just think there's just so much work to do. But at the same time, just so inspire and hearten that there is so much work going on. I mean, every time I hear, you know, Shelly speak or Ross speak, I just feel like, you know, there's there's a lot of hope. And I, I also really appreciate Ezra's comments about sort of expanding the way, um, you know, we look at young people and, and how, you know, it shouldn't just be like the curriculum and like some work experience, but also competence, competencies and strengths, which I, I, I totally, um, you know, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think that the issue is that employers don't really have that mindset in the sense that, you know, the signals for selecting young people or even like in Canada, newcomers, you know, to, uh, to, to the workforce, you know, we're looking for this sort of the usual signals, right? Of like, you know, work experience or Canadian experience or like what university did you do? And even this, I'm writing, you know, recommendation letters for PhD students. You know, we're, we're thinking constantly about like what those sort of signals and as selectors, like we go for very basic signals, right? Like how many publications or what university you're from or like who, who's your supervisor. And I don't know as, as selectors, you know, we've really changed our mindset. And I think there's a lot of work, especially with this group, you know, sort of like a, trying to change that. I think maybe as where you have some, some thoughts on on how we can we can change that mindset, um, and then another thing that I that that I hear with Shelley talking about, you know, healthcare and NHS is this issue also with occupational stereotypes. I guess you know, with with both young people thinking about what health work is, and and so this sort of this this uh, sort of selection out of of a really potentially good sector to be working in. And, and also the fact that healthcare has this, is sort of intersects with, um, with gender, right? And the fact that, you know, like healthcare is so feminine and so then wages and like who, you know, is just not given as much weight to, to it, right? And so I feel like this is sort of a bunch of things going on. So anyways, just sort of some, some of my thoughts, but again, thanks for all your comments. Um, it's been really, valuable for me. Thank you, Sumi. Nice to see you again as well. <laughs> Ezra, do you want to take that up first? Yes, yes. Thank you, Bagin. Thank you, Sumi, for the question. I think it's very insightful. The selection, you know, the selection mindset of the recruiters, I think that's really important because sometimes it leaves many of the, you know, potential candidates out of the loop. So what we do at DDI is basically to work with the recruiters and the selectors and try to understand, you know, the purpose of their selection for different positions and job families. 
So we ask them, you know, the job requirements and the job analysis criteria, as well as, you know, the competency criteria. And we carry out sessions with them to make sure that they have this, you know, solid reasons why they are using, a, you know, a certain success profile. What we do is with, you know, we carry out some focus group sessions with the recruiters and line managers. And we ask them really, you know, some crucial questions. What do you expect this person to do? And how do you expect this person to do that? So the what and the how is very important to define. And most of our role is about, you know, sometimes educating these people to find the right, you know, set of criteria and, you know, providing the means for them to do that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's like the A of the alphabet. If that, they have that set of criteria right, the selection criteria, then they make better decisions and more sustainable decisions. And they don't leave the, you know, the potential people outside, you know, so they have a more fair and, you know, uh, right or just applicant resource pool. Does that answer your question? And I guess in, in light of such high unemployment rates, they've got very little reason to kind of think about who they're leaving behind because they've got so many other people to choose from as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Shelley, I'm, I'm conscious of time and I know you're, you need to leave promptly. Would you like to say a couple of words about the occupational uh, stereotypes and the gender intersect at healthcare as well? Which is mm -hmm. quite interesting. Yes, I just I wanted to build first on what um, Ros was saying about the living wage. So what I was saying earlier about integration and um, identifying the deprivation and reducing of health inequalities is predicated on the living wage. So when I talk about um, the career, and this is very much to do with this sort of intersector thing, because many of those jobs are done by women and they haven't been valued. However, later on in a career path, some of those women are actually paid extremely well. And it's what needs to be done is the whole system needs to change and investment needs to be made at the early end. So there are lots of pushes going on um, for the living wage. This preceded uh, the COVID-19 thing. So the budgets that might well have been used for that, and there's been a lot of work going on in public health um, and in Department of Employment, uh, um, DWP, all sorts of uh, different departments working across to try and do this. We, we're never going to move on until we value that work. And it's a cultural thing. It's, it's a, a social thing. And I think it is very gendered. And I, I wonder whether, um, but however, you know, if we think about it, in some of those young families in the 19 to 24 age group where people are in uh, partnerships and may have young families, it's often the woman who is working and the man who is unemployed and many of the sectors are in, in the care sectors. So we've got a lot of work to do, really a lot of work to do, but I feel we all need to be doing that professionally. So academically from uh, our work psychology background, we need to be talking to people, but also personally, uh, when we're talking to uh, anyone that we might have influence in, we all have power, we all have agency, even though we think it may not be very big, we should still be doing something. So I agree completely with what you were saying, Roz, um, about the living wage. And it, it, but it's not something that's in isolation. It, it links to all the work that we're doing. But I just want to say thank you so much to everybody. Uh, we have to keep on saying these things and doing these things and making these changes, because if we don't in our profession, then who else is going to do that? So thank you very much for having me. And uh, I will have to go now. Thank you for your uh, thank time you. and all your inputs and insights, Shelley. It was wonderful to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious we have run out of time two minutes ago. <laughs> um, so I think it's time to say thank you uh, to all our, our participants. And Dora's put in a link for an evaluation form that Bill has specifically asked me to ask everyone to fill in. So if you could take the time to click on, on the link and um, um, give us some feedback, that would be much appreciated. 
Uh, the digital exhibition, because it's on LinkedIn, it will stay on LinkedIn. So please feel free to go back and engage with, with, with the um, illustrations. Um, and I did say thank you to Shelley uh, just because she was leaving, but also thank you to all our, our speakers today. Thank you, Ezra. Thank you, Ambrose. Thank you, Maya, for your time today. And we will share um, the outputs from this hour's uh, meeting, whether that would be in videos or illustrations of, of other kind. <laughs> I see nodding. <laughs> um, Dari has been working in the background um, uh, soon with, with everybody and let's keep in touch and as Shelley said let's keep on talking about the, the topic because I think we do need to talk more. Okay. Thank you very much everybody.